Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the inaugural lecture of Prof. Portia Jordan. I am now going to ask all of you to please stand as we observe the entrance of the procession. So good evening colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, family. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Nico Gey van Petiers. I'm the Vice Dean for Research and Internationalization of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of Stellenbosch University. I would like to extend a warm word of welcome to each and every one of you present here in person uh, and online uh, on this wonderful occasion, uh, the inaugural lecture of Professor Portia Jordan. A special word of welcome to our DVC Research Innovation Postgraduate Studies, Professor Moyo, our DVC for Strategy, Global and Corporate Affairs, Professor Klopper, um, the Dean, Prof. Almi Miller, uh, the members of the Dean's Management Team, our previous Dean, Professor Vormink, and of course our inaugural lecturer this evening, Professor Jordan. And then a warm welcome to all the family and the friends and the colleagues of Professor Jordan that are attending in person and online. These include all the heads of the departments of the nursing education institutions in the Western Cape and other provinces, postgraduate students, and in particular, Mr. Eric Tornu, the doctoral, uh, doctoral candidate from Ghana in, in the audience, staff members in the Department of Nursing and Midwifery, Jody and her family members, Charles, her father, Jeffrey, and brother, Brent, from Port Elizabeth, her daughter, Gabriella, and Joshua, her son. Welcome. We also welcome all guests from outside the university and all our colleagues from Stellenbosch campus. So, inaugural lectures is a really special celebration in our faculty on the annual calendar of our faculty. We always look forward to it because it's such a joyous, joyous occasion uh, where we really celebrate and um, think about the the life journey of a person um, that came up to the professorate. 
Uh, it celebrates this defining moment in the person's career where they uh, have um, made a significant contribution to their field, to, to science, and can be awarded the academic rank of professor. So it really is a joyous occasion for us, for the faculty, for the university, uh, to have uh, Professor Jordan here this evening. Thank you very much for being here and for presenting this evening. And um, I would like to now hand over to Professor Almi Miller, the Dean of our faculty, to please introduce our candidate. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, fellow colleagues, family members of Professor Jordan, it's with great pleasure that we gather here this evening to celebrate and attend Professor Jordan's inaugural lecture. We're celebrating her trailblazing journey in nursing and beyond. Professor Jordan currently holds the position of Professor and Executive Head of the Department of Nursing and Midwifery at Stellenbosch University. Her remarkable expertise has been instrumental since she joined this university in 2019. Her leadership and dedication continue to make a significant impact in advancing nursing and midwifery in this university. Her academic journey started at Nelson Mandela University and led to the acquisition of numerous degrees and diplomas. Her career spans expertise in critical care, academic leadership, and had made many global contributions. She spent clinical time at Tigerberg Hospital in her younger years before she went back to Port Elizabeth. And then when she moved back here, she became the executive head of uh, nursing and midwifery. She wanted to move beyond individual patient care, and she started to participate and lead community health initiatives, health education programs, and public health campaigns. She's the chair of the Forum of University Nursing Deans of South Africa, a member of various prestigious professional bodies and committees. She served as an executive member of the COVID-19 response in South Africa, and she's a fellow of the Academy of Nursing of South Africa. She also demonstrated her commitment to advancing healthcare standards, both nationally and internationally, being a member of the Sigma Theta Tau International Society that promotes nursing excellence in communities worldwide, but also makes a very big difference in the local and regional level in South Africa. She serves on the Education Committee of the Consortium of Universities of Global Health and the Nursing Committee of the African Forum for Research and Education in Health. It is clear from these memberships and roles that Portia plays a pivotal role in strengthening nursing education and professional standards in this faculty as well as on the continent. Tonight, the theme, To Air is Human, Developing Evidence-Based Approaches for Safer Healthcare, will promise to be a captivating exploration of critical aspects in healthcare and in nursing as such. As we gather to listen to Portia's insightful lecture, we are privileged to witness her profound expertise and vision for advancing healthcare in South Africa. Her dedication to patient safety and evidence-based healthcare practices serves as an inspiration to the entire academic and healthcare community. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Jordan as she takes the stage. Thank you, um, Professor Miller, for that warm welcome. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Professor Moyo, Professor Klopper, um, our Vice Deans, Prof um, Professor Nico van Pitties, Prof Baikis, Dr. Fish, and our former Dean, um, Prof. Jimmy Formic, all proud to observe. And thank you to all of you that's attending in person and online. As a point of departure, um, 
My lecture, as you've heard, is um, just to err uh, is human. And that is also addressing the development of evidence-based approaches to improve um, healthcare safety within nursing and beyond. And I aim with this lecture to do seven things. And the first one is just to address patient safety, which is the critical aspects of that. Evidence practice, um, based practice is a patient safety competency. And then just to talk a little bit about the program of scholarship examining EBP in relation to patients that is compromised with mechanical ventilation in critical care units. And then to look at patient safety through an educational lens to talk about the international health institution aims and then about future directions as any professor should do and then to end off with some appreciations. Now, after I've worked in critical care units for about a decade, or as some of you might know it as the ICU, which is a complex and a fast-paced environment. ICUs are considered a high-risk environment due to the medical conditions, using sophisticated technology, and caring for critical ill patients with complex clinical problems, which require multiple and particular strategies to enhance quality of care in these areas. This is also where life-saving procedures are done and patients are most vulnerable and depend on healthcare teams for the utmost delivery of care from essential care practices to the most technological advanced care, to successful recovery and rehabilitation, or to a peaceful death. Long working hours, high patient loads, understaffing at some times, and healthcare professional burnout all contributes to high error rates in the critical care units. A lamentable phenomenon which understandably garners some empathy but yet is potentially disastrous for patient outcomes and safety. Critical ill patients also require endotracheal or nasotracheal intubation for mechanical ventilation, and that is to support them with their respiratory efforts when they cannot breathe on their own and they need assistance. Mechanical ventilation is also indicated for numerous clinical reasons and physiological reasons. And the management of mechanically ventilated patients is multi-layered, often requiring high technical psychomotor skills, advanced pathophysiological knowledge, expertise in invasive monitoring, and the implementation of evidence-based interventions through clinical decision-making. Intubation as a procedure has inherent complications, and that is when you put an endotracheal tube um, to support the patient's airway and connect it to a mechanical ventilation. And amongst these complications are the failure to intubate, what consequent requirements um, and difficult, like difficult intubations, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, airway obstruction, tube obstruction or occlusion, incorrection to um, tube placement, like right main stem intubation, bronchial or esophageal intubation, tube dislodgement, aspiration, severe hypoxia, hypoxemia, hypotension, local trauma to the oral cavity, the larynx or the trachea, tracheal stenosis um, and acrosis, upper respiratory infections like ventilator-associated pneumonia, and tracheobronchitis or many other complications that is associated with these procedures and being connected to a mechanical ventilator. Patient safety can this significantly be compromised when admitted to the critical care unit and intubated to the mechanical ventilator. And in response, healthcare professionals in the environment, especially nurses who are at the bedside 24-7, have been searching for safe practices and asking what should they do to make healthcare safer for this population of patients. And this was my beginning of my journey in asking 
what should we do and on what should we base our clinical decisions and practices when caring for these vulnerable patients? How do we ensure that we keep these most vulnerable population of patients safe from harm? And if we do fail, how do we create or co-create solutions to fix the problems? After all, to err is human. And as I quote from the WHO, to err is human, and expecting flawless performance from human beings working in a complex high-stress environment is unrealistic. Reason also uh, concurs in stating that a fundamental principle of the system approach to error reduction is the recognition that all humans make mistakes and that errors are expected even in the best organizations. However, it might be part of human nature to err, but it's also part of human nature to create solutions, to find alternatives, and to make health safer for all patients. The quest for these solutions um, prompted my research journey and prompted my clinical questions. My interest in patient safety in healthcare was further, further stimulating in exploring the patient safety reports and literature pertaining to patient safety incidents globally and in critical care units. And those patient safety reports started from the 1990s, like the first report was to Err uh, is Human by the Institute of Medicine, following by Crossing the Quality of Ch Chasm, the quali Crossing the Quality of Global Chasm, Health Professional Education, Keeping Patients Safe, Preventing Medical Errors, and much more reports that followed after that. And since the publication of the first report by the Institute of Medicine in 1999, and the consequential reports that followed, it was called on all healthcare professionals and hospitals and healthcare organizations to make improving patient safety a national priority, and they've been searching for safer practices, asking, what should we do to make health safer? And according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, patient safety should be prioritized in quest to achieve universal health coverage, which is not only about coverage and affordability, but also about quality and providing safe care, which is linked to um, the SDG 3.8. Patient safety strategies should be linked also to the Global Safety Action Plan 2021 to 2030 that was promulgated by the World Health Organization as well. And from these reports and other pieces of evidence, alarming statistics were reported. And some of those statistics um, is stated that patient harm is the 14th leading contributor of global disease burden. One in 10 patients will be harmed during their stay in the hospital. One in 20 patients will experience a healthcare-associated infection while in hospital. And the main causes of patient harm is medication and diagnostic errors, pressure injury, wrong site surgery in hospital care, hospital-acquired infection, and adverse events. And adverse events are injuries caused by medical interventions as opposed to health conditions of a patient. Adverse events are also due to unsafe care as the tenth leading cause of death and disability in the world. And a large proportion of adverse events are results of errors. And when an adverse event is a result of an error, it is considered a preventable adverse event. Furthermore, the consequences of patient harm is that preventable medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the USA, resulting in approximately 250,000 deaths per year. More than 134 million advert events occur each year among hospitalized patients worldwide, which contribute to more than 2.5 million deaths annually. 
And across low middle incomes, the cost of the lost productivity due to poor quality and unsafe care accounts for approximately $1.4 trillion annually. And approximately 15% of hospital expenditure and activity in OECD countries is attributed to safety failures. However, many adverse events are preventable, even if it's okay that to err is human. The consequences of patient harm in terms of fiscal um, uh, consequences is that we look at the gross domestic product, which is an economic term that represents the total value of goods and services of a country produced over a specific time, and it is commonly viewed as one of the most important indicators of health of a nation's economy. And in terms of patient safety and patient harm, the economic consequences in literature, as also reported in the Lancet 2019 paper, is that the GDP which is abbreviated for a gross domestic product, losses over 15 years due to consequences of mortality on labor force and physical capital accumulation. And the economic output losses between 2015 and 2030 was estimated for low-income countries as 2.6 of their GDP, upper-middle-income countries 0.9 of their GDP, and in 2017, the U.S. health spending accounted for 17.9 of their GDP, which is quite high. South Africa spends about 8.5 of its GDP on health care, which is higher than many of our industrialized and peer nations. Furthermore, we look at waste, which is the overuse of unnecessary, ineffective, and incorporate care, and that leads to inefficiency, medical errors, in coordination of care, misuse, fraud, and abuse. And these are all consequences of patient's harm. Furthermore, if we look at the professionals, healthcare professionals, over 50% of clinicians, as reported in literature in the USA, are affected by burnout, depression, and compassion fatigue. In the systematic review, it revealed that there is a high prevalence in Africa of, among healthcare professionals of anxiety, moral distress, and depression. High care professional burnout is a public health crisis that have been exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic and the consequences such as occupational injury, untended medical errors, low morale, and absenteeism was reported. And as a result, the quality and safety of healthcare are being compromised as healthcare professionals who are experiencing poor mental and physical health as a greater risk, and they are at a greater risk for making medical errors. What are the errors then in the critical care unit that has been reported in literature? Most of them is adverse events, delirium, knowledge and human factors, particularly knowledge deficits of healthcare professionals, handover errors, falls, medications errors, communication between healthcare professionals, the team, and the different interprofessional teams, pressure ulcers, technical devices or operating errors, infections, pain assessment and management, and that all lead to prolonged ICU length of stay and obviously cost, and mortality and morbidity. The patient safety risk associated with intubation and mechanical ventilation, and I have different categories starting with intubation, is as I previously mentioned. With endotracheal tube placement, it's aspiration injury to airway, esophageal intubation, and the ones that I mentioned before. ED tube cuff pressure um, uh, complications, airway patency uh, complications, which occurs when your endotracheal tube suctioning is not done appropriately or ineffectively, and ventilator setting or monitoring complications, which can lead to ventilator-induced complications or ventilator injury or risk for injury in these patients, particularly mechanically ventilated patients. And all of these areas was part of my doctoral study where I particularly looked at airway complications and the knowledge and the best practices related to that and how to prevent harm 
for this population of patients. So a lot of patient safety um, interventions was um, promulgated by various organizations um, after almost two decades after the release of the IMO report. And as you can see here, there was the Quality Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which was actually a mandate from the IMOA. And one of their mandates was to look at evidence-based practice and to look at what is the best practices and that we can put in place to ensure safe practices for patients, um, not only in critical care units, but in all healthcare institutions. The critical care societies, it was about um, 19 societies that came together in 2019, felt so strongly about patient safety and a commitment towards patient safety that they said, Without a safe environment, it's not possible to provide quality of care that we all aspire to. And this is especially true in the intensive care units or critical care units, as we sometimes know it. Given the very fragile nature of patients we care for, often in the extreme of age, unconscious and with minimal margins for error imposed by their deranged physiology. This is a global problem and it requires a global solution. We believe that improving levels for critical ill patients is achievable in all units and in all countries, irrespective of the available resources. If safety of our patients is increased, then the quality of care that we provide will also improve. So what is evidence-based practice then? Evidence-based practice is a problem-solving approach to the delivery of health care um, that integrates the best uh, evidence from a body of research, taking consideration of clinical expertise, patient preference or values, and research evidence. Evidence-based practice in all our patient safety literature are seen and highlighted as a patient safety competency. And so this triggered me to start my program of scholarship examining evidence-based practice in relation to patients compromise on mechanical ventilation in critical care units. And the theoretical underpinning that was the stimuli for my research was the Joanna Briggs Institute model of evidence-based health care. And they have different areas, but I'm going to focus on evidence generation, synthesis, transfer, and implementation. So starting off with evidence generation, it has three components, namely research, expertise, and discourse. And I'm not going to go through all of that on that slide. But what I want to highlight is that we started off evidence generation over the last couple of years with um, my research program. Looking first of all, so what are the mechanical ventilation and patient safety practices? And then focusing on three areas, namely the experiences of the patients and the experiences of the nurses. And the reason why we focus on nurses was because they 24 seven at the bedside and provided the most care for these vulnerable patients. Then looking at knowledge, knowledge about mechanical ventilation in terms of modes, initiation, prevention of ventilation, associated complication, and in a big area of our work, also focus on weaning the patient from the mechanical ventilation, or also called, uh, called liberation as a new terminology. And then also looking at essential patient care practices that I call it. And that is looking at your basic practices like oral hygiene, nutrition, pressure ulcers, eye care, um, endotracheal tube verification, capnography use, and endotracheal suctioning. But also realizing that we cannot only focus on the practicing, but we must also focus on what is EVP? Do people understand what is evidence-based practice? The concept, what does it mean? What are the processes? How do they implement it? Do they understand how to search for literature and how to um, to actually go about the processes of EVP. And then also looking at clinical practice guidelines as a tool for EVP. So we started looking at 
what do nurses know about the availability of clinical practice guidelines? Do they know where to find them? Do they know where to search for it? Do they know how to apply the evidence-based practice process on searching for these guidelines? But do they also know on how to implement it and what implementation strategies are available? And that was a body of work that we started in terms of the first step of evidence-based generation. And I must say that delivered quite a bit of um, data for us and I think the main findings of that, that care was not consistent. There was variant in care and differences in care delivery. Care was embedded in traditional practices and rather than the latest evidence which compromised patient safety. Practitioners knew about evidence, but they did not know how to implement or how to understand how guidelines, for instance, were developed and how it could be used. They, what we call, had the no gap and the no do gap. So they did not understand fully about how to use evidence-based practice and where to go and look for evidence in order to make decisions and to care for these patients. And they had limited understanding about the concept and evidence-based healthcare and how to search, appraise, synthesize, and implement this evidence. So that left us with more research questions and the quest to go on to the next um, level. I must also say from that, the inner circle that I talked about, there was rich evidence available on the nurse's experience in the ICU, the nurse's experiences of nursing patients on mechanical ventilation, but there were little evidence available about the patient's experiences. And that might be due to the fact that they are on the critical care in the journey in the critical care unit, being on medicinal most of the time, being um, suffering from critical neuropathy, critical illness, neuropathy, etc., and also sometimes being in the critical care unit for so long. So that was a gap that we identify even in the rehabilitation processes of these patients. So it left us with more research questions on what to do next. And so we moved on, and this, um, just to, before I move to the next one, these were just some of the people I want to acknowledge. It was all the ICU nurses that were part of this journey in that first phase, and some of the publications that were generated from um, these studies. So evidence synthesis has also three components according to Joanna Brick's model, and that was systematic or other reviews, clinical practice guidelines, and evidence um, summaries. And here we focus more on some systematic reviews, but as you know, it's a very challenging process. So we reverted to other types of reviews like scoping reviews. And we looked at scoping reviews on clinical practice guidelines, what is available, what can be used in the ICU. We looked at training programs, educational interventions, um, practices regarding mechanical ventilation, and two studies focus on patient safety education and curricula and content and strategy. We also looked at particularly a review on implementation strategies for EBP implementation in the critical care units. And then we moved over to say, okay, so right now we found these CPGs, so what do we do about it? So do we contextualize it, adopt it, or adapt it? And that was also some part of the work that we did. And then in terms of evidence summaries, because the critical care units uh, are fast-paced and high complex, we then develop algorithms as part of evidence summaries. And um, our work extended then at that point in time beyond the critical care unit to some of the emergency care units as well. And I just want to highlight one of the latest studies then focused on, and I think one of the candidates is in the audience, on pain um, assessment and, um, and, man and, and pain assessment and management. Um, then the next one was about evidence refer transfer. So there, Joanna Briggs uh, again highlighted three components, namely education, active dissemination, and system in integration. And we focus on education, the education part, because that's part of our work and part of our daily interaction with students and other healthcare professions. 
So evidence transfer is defined as the act of transferring knowledge to individual health professionals, health facilities, and health systems globally by means of journals, other publications, electronic media, education and training, and also decision support systems. Um, we develop interventions and mainly educational intervention and using specific methodologies for developing those educational intervention and implementing it amongst critical care nurses to make a difference to the findings that we noted during the evidence generation phase. Some of those findings were favorable, others were not. But it highlighted also the fact that um, factors such as culture, organizational leadership, extrinsic and intrinsic factors need to be considered. And also that teamwork and collaboration needed to be included in our next layer of research. And those were some of the publications that we generated in terms of um, Um, then evidence implementation, um, we did some studies that focused on in these three areas of context analysis, facilitation of change, evaluation processes and outcomes on barriers and facilitation specifically to the critical care units and to EBP and we also did some studies then focusing on organizational culture, leadership and change models, particularly looking at organizational culture and leadership within the critical care unit and how it facilitate um, the transition and the acceptance of um, evidence and evidence-based uh, practice and um, tools like CPGs within the critical care units. Change models, we're currently busy with studies looking at how we can implement change, how we can measure it, and how we can actually use tools to measure those. For some of the organizational culture and leadership, we actually work with an organization in Canada looking at particularly um, the Alberta context tool to look at context and um, how does that affect organizational performance and organizational transformation, which was some of our very interesting studies that we did. So what was the, the other um, work that we did uh, beyond critical care unit? We developed also, uh, after developing a, a program of scholarship in relation to patients with mechanical ventilation, we also started looking at emergency units and the latest uh, PhD candidate that graduated looked at the BPG for pain assessment and management, and that was in the Western Cape. In the perioperative units, which I always see as perioperative, which is your operating theater, your emergency units, and your critical care units as high acuity units working together, we looked at family, um, patient family-centered care. We also looked at strategies for CPG implementation in operating rooms, and those studies were done in Ghana as well as in the Eastern Cape. And then also looking particularly at the patient's experience and wanting to explore beyond critical care and acute settings, um, we moved to primary care settings and looking at care pathways for newly diagnosed adult patients with TB, HIV, co-infections, and that study is currently going on in the Eastern Cape. And then also looking at the primary care setting, a BPG for self-management support for adults with TB, HIV, co-infections, and that study is in Ghana and the candidate, I think, is in the audience, as well as the co-supervisor, which I need to acknowledge, Dr. Michael McCall and Dr. Uh, almost Dr. <laughs> Mr. Eric Dorda. And then also looking at the educational sphere, we look at ev evidence-based healthcare among nurse educators at a nurse education institution, and also expanding that in other institutions in Lesotho. And then wanting to stimulate the interest in what is happening in acute medical and surgical wards, we started with looking at evidence-based health competencies amongst nurses on the platform, and that study is undergoing currently in the Northern Cape, and that's quite a huge sample of um, the target population that we identified. Then furthermore, on an international level, we looked at patient safety through an educational lens, and this work started in 2017, where we came together as nurse educators from six different countries as part of the International Student Seminar for Global Citizen and Peace. 
And the countries that were involved as part of the international network of universities was Japan, Spain, Sweden, um, USA, and South Africa, and the United Kingdom. And the methodology we used here was workshops. We look at different teaching didactics. We look at simulation. We looked at faculty and student handbooks, training material, and we developed that for faculty as well as students. And we actually developed this outcomes of that um, projects, uh, 17 uh, patient safety champions, which were students, manuscripts and conference presentations, and the faculty at these international, um, international network of university schools of nursing develop competence to effectively teach safety com concepts to a total of 18,500 students amongst the schools that were represented. And that work continued since 2017, and we're working on various other patients' initiatives that's transferring patient safety competencies into the curriculums and curricula of nursing. We also expanded that work from an undergrad platform to a postgrad platform looking at cultural competencies, global citizenship, leadership, because we believe that all forms part of the different layers of patient safety. And so far we have had two research grants and we started disseminated some of that work. And as you can see, International Network of Nurses, um, International Network of Universities um, is represented, but those six countries globally was part of this work and is still ongoing work. And that's our team from Horashima University, Kingston University, James Madison University, Malmo University, and the University of uh, Roma uh, Vigilia in Spain. And that is at the bottom part, of the rest of the INU network universities. Patient safety through educational level at the national level were pursued. And in South Africa, we work together with Fundisa, which is the Forum for University Nursing Deans in South Africa. And we also had an initiative during COVID with Stellenbosch University, Wits University, and Devon University of Technology worked together. And there we had an educational response to, COVID, uh, to the COVID pandemic, and we trained 1,500 nurses across the eight province, and particularly looking at patient safety, infection and prevention, the respiratory care, mechanical ventilation management, because at that stage we believe that COVID patients need to, um, nurses need to know how to manage COVID patients in terms of airway support and mechanical ventilation because it was so different due to the disease and the disease profile. But we also looked at a module on psychological safety, death, dying, and palliative care. And then also with the Center for um, Evidence-Based Care here at Stellenbosch um, and Fundisa, there were some training workshops in evidence-based care steps and the implementation, and those workshops will probably still continue, and again, I need to acknowledge the evidence-based um, uh, Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare at our university for their contribution here. And those, the methodology of particularly the Fundisa response was captured in an article that was also published. Patient safety through an educational lens of current research studies. We are looking at patient safety education and how to integrate that into the curriculums. And we're looking particularly as evidence-based care as a patient safety competency and the integration into undergrad nursing curriculums and then also in nurse, critical care nursing curriculums. And those two studies, PhD studies, are underway at the moment. Furthermore, um, EBP can also be seen as part of, um, if we look at the, the benefits of EBP, um, then findings from a body of research indicate that healthcare quality, population health outcomes cause clinical engagement and satisfaction known as the quadruple aim, which is then part of um, the International Health Institute, um, has also a, a very strong link to EBP because EBP enhances the patient's experience, which includes better health quality and safety. It improves patients' outcomes, it reduces costs, and it empowers clinicians as well as improve their work life. And this is known as the quadruple aim in healthcare. And if we look at the previous documentation or literature, we had the triple aim that did not include the care team well-being. 
and since literature and development of the IHI model came while being particularly off the COVID has been included in that. So if we look at the outcomes of EBP, it can be very, very much a link to your quadruple, uh, quadruple aim. And in the IHI framework on the experiences of care, there's particularly two perspectives that are highlighted and considered, and that is the patient experience and the quality of care. The first perspective is that the individual who interacts with healthcare systems and evaluates um, care. The second perspective is that the healthcare system, which focuses on designing a quality experience for patients defined by the six dimensions on improvement um, as per IOM, is safety, effectiveness, timeliness, efficiency, quali equality, and patient-centeredness. And value-based healthcare has become an increasingly important strategy to ensure high quality and safe healthcare. And that is underpinned with best evidence with simul simultaneously cost-effective, and that is important for achieving universal health coverage. So um, that's so important for future directions then to look at the IHI model and some of the work that I'm doing now is to use the IHI model and to start packing the work that we've done within that IHI model, but particularly with two perspectives. The one is an educational perspective, looking at capacity building and integration into curricula, and the second one is looking at clinical perspectives by engaging with policy making to move evidence and safety practices into policy, looking more at team collaborations and interprofessional education as our work is mainly focused on the first level, namely our nurse population, looking at patient experiences in different contexts, which we already started, and documenting that and seeing how does that um, plug into the IHI model, and then also looking at health team well-being and the support structures, and we already started one study, particularly looking at what is the experiences of nurses, particularly after COVID, in the critical care unit, and what support structures are available for that. And then looking at implementing patient safety practices. But most importantly, I think the next phase of our work is going to look at the economic evaluation, looking at cost effectiveness, cost utility, cost benefits analysis, in order to look at lower cost of care and per capita cost as per IHI model. So lastly, I would just like to do words of appreciation, and I would like to thank the Dean, Prof. Almi Miller, the Vice Deans and the Dean's Management Team from the Faculty of Health Sciences, Medic Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University. I'd also like to thank Prof. Jamie Forming, who is being quite instrumental from my appointment and supporting me in my journey since I started at Stellenbosch University. I appreciate your support. And also the Department of Nursing and Midwifery, our staff, academic, um, for your support and assistance, the administrative staff, the human resource staff at Stellenbosch University, and the clinical staff. Um, also the patients, our research would not be possible without them, their families, and the professional nurses on the platform that made my research journey possible. Colleagues and previous heads of departments, leadership at Nelson Mandela University, where I sp spent most of my research work, especially Professor Delena van Roon, who was also my supervisor for my PhD. Friends, family, colleagues who supported me on my personal clinical and academic journey, mentors on my academic journey, and then also I'm very privileged to have Professor Klopper in the audience as our DVC tonight. And I thank her for her leadership, her guidance, her advice, and being a pillar of support through many, many years. And just being there not only for, um, on an academic level, but also on a personal level. So thank you, Prof. Klopper. And also Prof. Gwen Sherwood, who's been part of um, this journey as a mentor expert and patient safety consultant. And she's also been a Fulbright scholar and specialist and recently visited us on that. And then also past and present students, um, honors, masters, doctoral, and postdoctoral students, but 
particularly students, and I acknowledge that there are many more other students that has worked and been part of this journey, but I want to particularly acknowledge our current PhD students, and they're all in the top row, and then the master's students, which is currently working on some projects, previous master's students who work um, particularly on topics like liberation of ventilation, um, SBTs in ventilation, weaning, etc. And then also um, the three students on um, the, my left and right hand side are the three PhD students, although there were many others that played an instrumental role in advancing my work in mechanical ventilation and in best practice guidelines or clinical practice guidelines. And particularly, I want to thank Dr. Mapasa, which is at the bottom, and she's advanced PhD, my instruments in the Malawi context. And I believe that has made a significant impact in Malawi. And then also Prof. Sherwood, as I mentioned, and then a colleague of mine, Prof. Matenam Baloi, and she's been working with me in many of these projects, and I really want to acknowledge her tonight. And then also words of appreciation to my family, my parents, um, uh, Jeff and my mom, Rebecca, late Rebecca, for their continuous support and praise and love. My brother Brent in the audience for your love and support, Gabriella and Joshua for your unwavering support and your pillow of strength and love, and for God blessing me with the skills and abilities to fulfill my purposes in life. And then I want to do, if you allow me, a special tribute to my mom, which I lost 17 days ago. And I want to thank my mom for being the wind beneath my wings, my hero, my rock, and my strong tower. And she provided me with all the evidence I needed to succeed on my journey and implement the best practices in my life. She provided, the word of God was a main source and most rigorous form of evidence. Her life experiences, her firm foundation, her moral compass, her authenticity, her integrity, and her character of truth and compassion, love and care informed her decision making in every part of her life. She translated the best evidence in the form of guidance, words of wisdom, advice, and skills to me and my brother. Yet she allowed us to critically appraise the evidence as we grew older in becoming and living out our individuality and making our own life decisions. By using the tools and multifaceted strategies that she equipped us with, we were and still able to implement all that she taught us in life. She even audited our lives at times and guided us to improve our own quality of life. She was my evidence-based life champion and safety coach and the best expert I could ever ask for. She kept us safe as our protector, our shelter, our provider, our consultant, our advisor, and always had our best interests at heart. And the last week of her life, I had the opportunity to keep her safe. I had the opportunity to be reminded of the essentials of health care and how to return to the basics of health care in caring for her until she gave her last breath of life. And the privilege for me was she was there when I took my first breath of life. And she was there, when, and I was there when she took her last breath of life. I thank her for the education and legacy that she left and the parts that she crafted the love that she lavishly and freely given and the blessing that she stored up not only for us but many others in so many ways and i would not have been here and could not have done this without her and she would live in our lives forever and me and brent could surely echo the words we are because of you mom and all that i am and all that i have is because of you and i am because of you i thank you I think on that note, maybe uh, just to say thank you so much for the talk. 
And um, uh, just our greatest sympathies on the loss of your mom. I was just talking to your dad, I think, just before we came in. I imagine it's a very difficult time for you as well. So maybe if we can just give a few moments of silence in memory of her mom. And I just want to use this time then to pray that God gives you the strength and your family to really, uh, you know, remember your mom in all the positive ways that she impacted you. And we can see the meaning of family and just being there. And just uh, today she should be very proud of you wherever she is. So I just want to thank you for that. So thank you for um, delivering the lecture. My name is Sibusi Moyo. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies at Stellenbosch University. I just want to observe all protocols based on my colleagues who already um, uh, listed the names that we had to acknowledge so that we save on time. So all protocols observed from the rectorate, uh, the faculty management, um, the family, friends, and colleagues who have joined us today, and to yourself, of course, congratulations on the lecture. So, of course, uh, my role is really to respond in terms of the lecture. So, um, as you know, um, today we really want to recognize uh, Professor Aposha Jordan for um, being able to become a full professor and uh, attaining her full professorship. So, part of the inaugural lecture really is the day that we actually um, give an opportunity as a university to our staff to be able to share with the public. And um, the public, of course, consists of the university community, our external partners, and the challenge is to be able to explain the scientific jargon so that um, even um, uh, your, your children, the grandmother, the parents can understand what the person does at work. I know most of us people maybe don't really understand what we do anyway at work. So thank you so much for being able to explain, um, you know, um, the, the topic that you chose today very well. Um, and then, of course, the other thing I think that I should mention about uh, Professor Yodan, Porsche Yodan, that you may not know, is that uh, so we have an instrument we use uh, for assessing and evaluating research. So just between 2018 and 2022, um, from the work that she did, and most of it, of course, had a high impact within the medicine area, nursing area, and then, of course, some of it because she does do interdisciplinary work. There was a social, science, uh, social sciences as well impact in that area. And then immunology and microbiology as well as pharmacology and toxicology. So the work is quite broad and you can see that she's able to work across those areas as well. But of course, with a main focus around nursing and medicine as well. So the citation just between that period was about 93 citations, um, which is quite big for nursing with a field-weighted uh, citation impact of 0 0.54. So as an engaged institution um, that is anchored within our region, it is good to see from the work, for example, today we have seen that from the topic that was chosen, uh, that there's a lot of collaboration, not just, it's not work she does on her own, of course, collaborating with other colleagues, but also um, making sure that the relevance within our region, um, within the continent, and you saw some countries where you are doing work, I think Lesotho, uh, was it also Ghana, and uh, students from all over the place as well. Um, that healthcare itself, we do see that actually, even at provincial level, healthcare has, has um, challenges not just within South Africa but also across the continent. And we saw from COVID-19 that providing solutions uh, just for the country is not sufficient because we do get affected by also global challenges in any case. So when disease spreads, it spread, uh, spreads across borders. Um, and so it's important for us to actually look broader than just our institution. So this sits in well with the university strategy which aims to actually um, you know, strengthen our global partnerships um, our continental partnerships and also for us to be anchored within our region and being relevant to our healthcare system as well at provincial level. So the inaugural lecture, of course, marks an important milestone. And uh, again, I want to thank the faculty for creating an environment which is enabling uh, so that people can flourish and people like, especially women now that we are uh, also approaching August to see women who become full professors uh, in our in our in our you know professoriate and black women for that matter because that's a percentage which is also quite lacking. I, I just had some stats. In fact, yesterday I was giving a talk at another function where in mathematics, which is my field, we only have one A-rated researcher since the A-rating started. A-rating system started. So it shows you, and I, I think she's white female anyway. 
So, you know, so it's good to see black women who are coming into the sector and also becoming part of the uh, professoriate and also mentoring others. So I should thank you for the fact that you have many students and you are contributing to that as well. Um, and then also the other thing is that, so I, I saw that in, uh, in the talk you gave, you also, also did refer to, so the earliest paper, I think in 2000 already from the, um, um, from the African Institute of Medicine report, uh, there was a group in the US which also commented on um, to A is human, developing evidence-based approaches uh, for safer healthcare. Um, was work which was already at that point, uh, you know, uh, started in the U.S. already. And there was concern that actually the health system itself, people were not dying from other, the, the biggest kill actually was through medical errors. And I think as South Africa, we are not so uh, far away from that as well. And I don't think we have done enough research even in our context in terms of these medical errors that, okay, so it's good to see that there's this type of work. And I believe there's a lot of opportunity for us uh, to work with our Department of Health and Health Sector to just see how best we can strengthen our healthcare systems um, as well. So, um, the, does anyone know what is the highest, uh, uh, highest top killer uh, in terms of diseases within our country at the moment? What is it? Trauma, yeah, TB at the moment. But I suspect that if we check the medical errors, it could even be higher, but we don't have evidence. I suspect that sometimes, yeah, the diagnosis, so I know of a case, for example, where somebody had malaria, but when they went to the hospital, uh, actually they were having a heart attack, but they were treated for malaria. And then they suffered, um, because it was a heart attack, of course, then eventually uh, they passed on. But I think these are anecdotes. We don't have evidence. But I, I want to challenge the faculty that actually maybe there's more work which needs to be done around uh, this as well. So I think that is important to note. So um, we thank you again for the lecture for covering three components. And uh, just to remind the audience, uh, if you remember, she explained in, I think, terms that we could understand. So for me, the challenge as a math person is that if I can understand, it means the lecture, the lecture was very good. Um, because it's difficult for me to understand. So she talked about the essentials of patient safety, right? Uh, she did also give examples of the work that's been done there. She also offered an overview of evidence-based practice, um, EBP, as an essential patient safety competency. And she also then shared, uh, of course, a program of scholarship um, examining evidence-based practices in relation to vulnerable patients on mechanical ventilation in the critical care unit. Again, here I do see a very strong possible collaboration with the engineering uh, people whom we are trying to push to collaborate with others. I, I know that uh, uh, Professor Hester, like we are trying to say, please, please, let's collaborate. Please, can we do something together? Because innovation needs us to work across disciplines. So I'm really glad that at least you are doing this type of work, but I, I just see also an opportunity for innovation if our engineers were also involved in this area. So, of course, in terms of research impact, which is one of our, uh, um, you know, greatest uh, objectives in the research strategy, the application of evidence-based practice is scaffolded by the establishment of case standards and pathways, integration with nursing education. And, and this, uh, you saw the, uh, I was really glad to see the training of 1,800, 500 nurses. Uh, with Deben University of Technology, which was my previous university, so I'm really excited about that. But for me, I mean, when we talk about uh, impact, we're not talking about publishing a nice paper, getting the professorship and putting it on the shelf, but also being able to help the sector to improve their practices, to improve their skills um, is a big thing. So in terms of impact, and then we also know that um, uh, this then helps to change the behaviors of nurses. I don't know how many of you have been sick in hospital and needing ventilation. I really respect nurses. I think they are the most helpful, but also the most dangerous. Don't annoy them. And I just, I, I don't know, wherever you are, this is what I learned. It doesn't matter if it's at work or in the hospital. Please, if you know a nurse, don't annoy them. You need them later on. Um, and that goes uh, as far as I know. Anyway, so having said that, yeah, I just want to, again, um, you know, thank everyone who helped organize this function today, uh, the colleagues, and I, I would just end by uh, giving, as part of our practice as a university, we have a certificate which we prepare very well, and I'll just collect it.
sorry, the certificate also needs decoding, and then I need to also give that together, and we need to stand somewhere. So before we do that, can we just give her a clap once more for the lecture today? <laughs> Thank you, Professor Moyo, and uh, also thank you to Professor Jordan uh, for a wonderful lecture. And um, uh, from my side as the Vice Dean of Internationalization, also good for you to know that she's one of our stars in terms of internationalization. So thank you also for your contributions to that. Uh, colleagues and friends, so we've come to the end of the proceedings, so I would like to thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you very much for people who drove uh, far. Um, it's sometimes very difficult for people to come to evening events, so we, we really appreciate it that you're here in person. And those of you who couldn't make it in person, thank you for joining online. Uh, thank you to the organizer of this evening. As you know, these things don't just happen overnight, so people uh, are behind the scenes working very hard in um, getting the, these type of events together. I'd like to express my gratitude to the whole team, including Megan Salon and all the members from Marketing and Communications, uh, our colleagues from the audiovisual um, section for their assistance, campus security, and everyone else who's made this event a, a wonderful evening. Um, I'd like to now declare the proceedings closed, and uh, I'd like to invite you all to come and enjoy something, some refreshments with us afterwards in the reception. Uh, thank you very much for attending once again, and for and congratulations once again, uh, Professor Jordan. And um, enjoy the rest of the evening, and drive safely. Thank you. <laughs>